It is a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And you know, when, when Gary and I talked about me coming out here, I really was excited to be able to come and speak to you. I, it's, um, it's, it's something that we as a ministry will want to do. We want to build a relationship with you as a congregation. Our database doesn't go back far enough for me to tell how long you guys have been giving to this ministry, but you're a big part of that. And, but, but the relationship is, is two ways. And so this gave me a chance to do something for you guys to, to fill in and, and give back a little bit. But also it helps us to be here to, to connect you with our ministry. That's, that's a part of the relationship as well. He mentioned that one of your Sunday school classes is part of our HUGS program. That is helping the underprivileged get started is what the acronym stands for. And uh, so that's important too. But I wanna invite you guys to participate in that personally as well. We've got my, my booth at the back there has these brochures, pamphlets. You can use that to sign up or you can go to our website. We just revamped it, we're really proud of it. Um, so go to our website, you can, you can check it out there or you can just talk to me afterwards. It's $25 a month, which isn't much, but the program is so much more than that because we invite you, you don't have to, a uh, good friend of mine supports a little girl. He doesn't, he's never written a letter. He just, that's just not him. But we invite you to correspond with the kids and get to know them. That is such a big part of this program. They get to know that people in the States uh, care about them and love them. It's not just some pie in the sky source where we get our funds. Um, I've seen this develop relationships through the years that are just amazing to where we've even had people come down and visit us and uh, you know they're, they're there for the kids' graduations from high school or even their weddings or things like that. It's truly an extension of the family is, is what gets built and it helps the kids so much to know that people care about them and love them. So if that interests you at all, please visit with me in the back afterwards and we'll talk more about that. Um, I mentioned just now having you come down and visit and that's another area that Gary and I have touched on just a little bit, but I would like to invite this church, this congregation, to bring down a group of people from this church to visit us. It's a short-term mission trip. Uh, we do several of them a year all summer long. Uh, it's, it's broken down into three parts. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, there's the work project. And, uh, we, you know, we got to keep you busy, right? But it's not all about the work. You'll be scheduled for, the, you're down for a week. You come in on Saturday and leave the next Saturday. And out of that week, you do about three and a half days on the work project, okay? So it's, it's important to us to have these groups because we don't want, for example, our house parents with a paintbrush in their hands trying to keep the place together. We want their focus, our staff's focus, to be on the kids. So it is important to us that these projects get completed. But on the other hand, we don't want it to be all about the work. There's, there's other aspects of it. Another part of it is the, uh, the culture itself. So on, you know, let's see, we switch things around. On Friday afternoon, we go out to the Teotihuacan pyramids and you get to explore those. And uh, these things are pre-Aztec. The Aztecs, when they discovered them, when they were still a nomadic tribe, they discovered these pyramids. And I'm getting way too deep. I'm, I'm spending time on stuff I don't intend to be spending time on. So I'll move ahead. Well, I can't. There's another cultural aspect. While you're down there, you get to eat I prepare the menu for you, okay, if you're there when I'm hosting. So you're eating all of my favorite Mexican dishes. So that's cultural, folks. And uh, you get to eat a lot of really good Mexican food while you're down there. Um, and lastly, of course, is the kids. You get to see the homes, visit, uh, share some meals with the kids, and get to know them. Play with them. Um, you know, I always tell people if you'll play even just a little bit of soccer with the kids while you're down there, you can legitimately come home and tell your friends and family that you're an international soccer player, okay? <laughs> so keep that in mind. It's a, it's a great thing. Anyway, we'll hopefully be talking more about that. We'd like to, like to get a group together to come down and, and visit us firsthand at Ninos de Mexico. Um, we're going to show a video now. It's just a couple of minutes long, and you guys may have even seen it already, but uh, we're, this video is just, it's called Faces of Pain.
I love that video because it says so well in such a short amount of time it, it, what you guys are doing. You're, you're helping to support this ministry um, and you're changing lives through it. And this is my... Last night was my first time with this. And this is the first time I've had a problem with it. Um, let me see. I'm going to just take a minute here and start from scratch and see if I can get back to my, my notes. However, I have my notes in my Bible, so give me just a second here, and it's gone. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. All right. We're going to go old school. Dig out some notes here. The only problem with that, the reason my wife encouraged me to use the tablet is that I'm getting to the age where I've got to put my glasses on and off to see my notes. Anyway, we are going to work this out here. We're going to read this morning together. We're just going to tear apart one verse, if you'll let me do that with you this morning. It's 2 Corinthians 2.14. So if you'll turn to that now, we will... Uh, we will dive in here. Okay, 2 Corinthians 2.14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. Now guys, when I first read that verse... I'll be honest, it didn't mean a whole lot to me. I, you know, I'm not, not a Bible scholar or anything. I have to really take a verse sometimes if it doesn't mean anything and, and reread it a few times and kind of look at what's been happening in the text before the verse and, and after it and try to, try to put it together and figure it out for me. So I'm going to break this down into two, two different parts. The first half of the verse, let's just take a quick look at that. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. So what is a triumphal procession? Well, I looked into it a little bit, and the Romans used to go out and they would conquer a neighboring village or city or wherever they were, and, and after they succeeded, they usually did, they were usually successful, they had a triumphal procession afterwards. They would t so it was a big parade. They would, the generals and the leaders would, would go through the town on their, on their big... Uh, Horses, and they, behind them would be the soldiers, and then behind that would be all the loot that they had gotten, wagons of, wagons of goods and animals they'd captured, and then the slaves, or the, the people they had defeated, they'd usually be tied up, and they would bring up the tail end. And that was a victory procession. That was this triumphal entry, okay, for, for the Romans. And so what is that telling us here? Let me read it one more time. There goes the glasses. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. So what is that saying to us? What is our triumphal procession? We win. That's what it means, guys. It's a victory parade. We win. Um, I, just, I just love that picture of it. It also leads me to, to think about, though, the fact that God never asks us to go somewhere where he's not already there. That's the way it was with me when me and my family first moved down to Mexico City. Uh, I still remember traveling across the border. We drove down when we moved down, and uh, I, the, the, you know, the American flag got smaller and smaller and smaller, and my heart was beating. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I was scared to death. But I found out later, God was already there. He asked us to go down there, and he was there before us, and he's always there before us. In Joshua 6 is the story of Jericho. You guys probably know that story. We're not going to go all the way through it this morning. But let, let me run back over the story just briefly with you. The, the folks in Jericho, they knew the Israelites were coming. They had scouts out and everything, and Israel had this reputation of being able to do amazing things for some reason, you know. And uh, so they were frightened. They knew they were in trouble, so they shut up their city tight behind their walls, behind their gates. They closed the gates, and they were prepared for a siege, okay? And so what did, what did, uh, 
What did God ask the Israelites to do in that scenario? Did he, did he have them create battering rams to knock down the gates and catapults to throw big rocks up against the walls and break the walls down that way? That's the way, you know, probably because I watched too many movies growing up of war scenes and stuff. That's what I have in my head of a typical siege, okay? But that's not what he did. Instead, they marched around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, he had to march around it seven times. And at the end of that, they screamed and yelled and they blew trumpets. And probably the vibrations from them marching around and all this noise with the screaming and yelling and trumpets, that probably broke those walls apart, right? The vibrations knocked the walls down and they came down, right? No, not at all. But the wall, as it says in the song, the walls did come a-tumbling down. How did that happen? Why did that happen? I think it's because God had a plan. And in that plan, the glorious part about this whole scenario is that he includes us in that plan. He wants our obedience in certain things, even if they don't make any sense, like marching around. Have you ever seen the VeggieTales edition of this story? You know, those little... Well, I don't remember what they were, peas or whatever. They were, uh, they were pretty confused about what they were supposed to be doing, right? But the walls came a-tumbling down because God had a plan and because the Israelites were obedient. And because of that, the walls came a-tumbling down. Now, the interesting thing I found out was that archaeologists have, in recent years, found what they believed to be the city of Jericho. I just heard this as a story, and since then, I found out that it's actually true. Uh, it's not just, not just a story a friend told me. But what they found, the reason they believe it was Jericho is not that the walls were just collapsed, like they would often find in this type of an archaeological dig. But the walls, I only have two hands, so I can only represent two walls. The walls are actually blown outwards, like this. So that, that just creates a picture in my mind that God was in Jericho when the Israelites were doing their marching. His presence was there. And because they were obedient, God blew those walls out. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? I don't know if that's how it happened or not, but that's the way, that's the way I picture it. It makes perfect sense to me. God, in his power, he just blew those walls out and down. And that was, that was the end of that. Let's, uh, let's move on to the second part of the verse. Through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. So what does that mean? He uses us to spread the knowledge of him, the knowledge of Jesus. And that is a fragrance. A fragrance to who? To God. And it's a pleasing fragrance. When, when they would do sacrifices and stuff, they would have burnt offerings. I, I always pictured that as just being nasty. The word burnt means not good, you know. But, but to God, it's a pleasing fragrance. And when we, we, you and I, through us, when we spread the knowledge of Jesus, that's a pleasing fragrance to our God. Isn't that an amazing thing? Let's take a few minutes to look at the sense of smell, if you'll indulge me for a minute here. Um, the senses, all of the senses that God gives us are pretty amazing, but, but I don't really think of the sense of smell as being that important, do you? I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things there. That the sense of touch, when we feel things, we know if it's hot or cold or sharp or, sharp or soft, that's fairly important to know how to do that, right? Uh, the sense of hearing. Uh, as I get older, my, my daughter's are telling me more and more often that I'm losing my hearing. I don't know, but they're probably right. I, I, there are times when I don't hear the things that I should hear. I'm getting old, I'm losing my sense of hearing. And losing that makes me feel of how important it is, right? Uh, probably to me, maybe the most immediate important sense is the sense of sight. And let's face it, I just met most of you, but I would much rather see you than smell you, you know? Um, I was just saying. So there are, there are good smells and there are bad smells. If, if you ever come visit Ninos to Mexico, if I am your host, you will hear me say that 
Mexico City is a city of smells. There are really good smells, lots of them. And there are really bad smells, lots of them. Um, if I'm walking down a, a street in Mexico City, I might smell fresh corn tortillas being made. And you know what that does to me? It turns me. I will, I will follow it. I will try to find the source of that smell because I'm drawn to it. I love fresh corn tortillas, okay? Uh, or the holidays are coming up. They're, we're, they're just right around the corner. Hopefully soon in my house, there will be fresh cookies being made and pies and things like that. If I walk in the house and I smell fresh cookies being made, I'm going to be drawn to that smell. I'm going to go investigate. I'm going to go to the kitchen and try to snag myself a cookie, right? Even if it gets me in trouble. That's what I'm going to do. It's just, it's just my nature to be drawn to a good smell. Bad smells, on the other hand, are a warning, are they not? I think God designed it that way. They're a warning for us to stay away, that it's not a good thing, generally. A bad smell is usually some waste or something rotting, something you don't want to go around. Um, let's let's uh, take a look at the skunk, for example. Now, I want you to be honest with me. I just, this is just for me personally, for a second here. Is there anybody in here that enjoys the smell of a skunk? Be honest. A little bit, thank you. Thank you, we got one honest person here. Um, I, and I'm not talking when it's real strong, but just, just on a con summer evening, you know, you get that light whiff of a skunk. I kind of like that, and I think it's because, you know, there's, there's times, let's look at it another way. Okay, this isn't going well. Um, <laughs> Do you ever just catch a whiff of a smell and it takes you back to your childhood just like that? That happens, right? That's an amazing thing about our sense of smell. It, it just triggers something in our brains. And usually it's so fast you don't even know what the smell was or what, the, what it is you're remembering. But it's a good thing and you want, you want more of it. You wish you could go grab a hold of that. You know, at least that's what happens to me. Well, for me, a light smell of skunk does that to me. But... Um, it, it can be a warning. And the interesting thing, a skunk is a good example because it can be a warning that maybe we kind of get used to and we don't heed the warning. One, one afternoon at home, I was kind of smelling a skunk. I knew because of that light scent that there was one in the neighborhood. But I forgot. I forgot to pay attention to that. And that uh, a little while later in the evening, I threw open the garage door to, to let my dog out. We were going to go for a run together. And he went right over to a couple of bushes, and he came out with a mouthful of skunk. And the situation went downhill from there really, really fast. It was like, no. Oh. Anyway, um, good smells draw us to it. Bad smells repel us. We, uh, we, we were in Mexico City living there for a couple of years before my mother and father-in-law ever came down to see us. And we were kind of showing off. We were going through an area to a fish market. We wanted to show them that we knew how to handle ourselves. You know, we could go to a fish market and buy, buy shrimp and just for the price you can gorge yourself on it. It was, it was a cool thing. So I'm driving along, had this big old ugly suburban down there. And we came to that part of the neighborhood where there's this open sewers. And I thought, oh, no. And I, I looked in the rearview mirror. My mother-in-law is sitting right directly behind me. And this is what I saw. It, the smell was so bad, it wasn't just enough to pinch off her nose. She was trying something brand new, trying to block this smell. Okay, it was bad. It was really, really bad. So, anyway, I almost wrecked. I was laughing so hard at her, but uh, <laughs> we are drawn to the good and we're repelled by the bad. I think that in our lives, that's an intricate part of being able to tell where we're at and where, what's going on. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about a couple of our kids to close here this morning. Um, we've had hundreds of kids go through our system. The first one I'm going to tell you about is Dr. Noe Flores. And yes, I said doctor because next year will be our 50th anniversary. Like Gary said in the beginning, you guys have been supporting us for 40 years. So Doc and his siblings were one of the first groups, family groups, to ever come and go through the Niños de Mexico system. 
doc became a doctor, medical doctor. He worked with the Mexico City hospitals for 19 years. And then 16 years ago, he came back to work with the ministry of Ninos de Mexico. And he's obviously the doctor for all of the staff and all of the kids. Well, Doc is old now. In fact, he retired this year. I can't quite get over that. The fact that Doc is retired is just amazing to me. But um, not only was he our doctor, to me personally, he was a mentor. He was an, he was an example to me of what a man of God should look like. And, and it's because everywhere he went, everything he did was to spread a sweet aroma of Christ. One of the things, we, we do other things with Ninos de Mexico other than just raise kids. I don't have time to tell you about them, but one thing we do is a medical village monthly. We go up to this, the, this village called Chalapa and we do medical ministry up there. And uh, it's why well, I'm getting, getting uh, to where I don't have time for the whole story. But need, let me just say, we would fill up the van with people on the way in to the village. And as soon as those doors closed, Doc would start telling them about Jesus. And the whole ride over, he would tell them about Jesus. Everywhere we went, Doc was all about telling people about Jesus. And it wasn't just him, though. Now he has four grown children now. His daughter, Susie, graduated from Kentucky Christian College. She and her husband are now part of a church plant in Pachuca, Mexico. His son, Saul, graduated from Dallas Christian College. He, uh, he is now in the Chicago area with his wife in a church plant telling people about Jesus. It's one example of one child. The other one I want to tell you about is a little guy named Joe Benjamin. Joe Benjamin was brought to us just a few days old. The police brought him to us in the middle of the night. He was born just after Christmas. And um, when I first heard about that, the police brought him straight to us. I, I really kind of pictured a scenario in my mind of the, kind of a baby Moses scenario. Probably his mother just couldn't keep him anymore. And so she... You know, it was, that's the cold time of year in Mexico City. Uh, it, was, it never freezes down there, but it gets, December and January, it gets down into the low 30s. So it's not good for a baby. So I, I pictured that he was well wrapped in a warm blanket. And Moses had his sister Miriam nearby, making sure he was found, making sure he was okay. So I kind of pictured that surely somewhere down the block, maybe his sister Maria was nearby to make sure he was found and taken care of. That was, that's what was in my mind. But I was down, I got down there a few weeks later, and I talked to Doc, and I said, you know, what, what's the story here? And he said, no, Mick, it wasn't like that at all. She, his mama, just literally threw him away. He was found unprotected in an empty lot on a pile of trash, literally discarded. Um, the police, somebody called him, called in the police immediately, and they brought him to us before there was any damage from exposure or anything like that. And they, they brought him to us. And, and they said, we will get you the parental rights to Joe Benjamin. When we bring in kids, we've got to have parental rights to the kids, okay? It's really important so that we can be above the law and, and make sure everything's right and legal, all of our T's crossed and all that. But anyway, they said they, they, would, they would do that for us, and so we, we took him in. And uh, a couple months later, though, they came back to us, and they said, we're sorry we shouldn't have promised you that because we can't produce that. We, you see, Mexico... Has this, has, they have laws where Joe Benjamin is a Mexican citizen, and so he has the right to go to one of these other homes where there's hundreds of kids and try to be adopted out. And truly, that's his best chance of being adopted because he's three years old and younger. The age of three is kind of the, the, the if they're younger than that, they have a pretty good chance, uh, I should say a better chance of being adopted. And that's very typical for a lot of third world countries. But we were already in love with Joe Benjamin, and we wanted him to be raised as a Christian. And so we did not want to give him up, but we didn't have a choice. And so we prepared. They said they'd be by the next day. Um, so we prepared to, to give him back. But they didn't show up. And so we thought, well, maybe sometime this week. And they never showed up. And so we thought, or at least I thought, well, it's, it's Mexico time. It's pretty laid back down there, you know. We can uh, maybe expect them sometime this month, but they never showed up. So we, we didn't just do nothing. We, we got proactive about it. We have a lawyer down there that's almost on a full-time retainer and uh, had him do some things, and we wrote letters to the government. And uh, every time I'd go down, I'd, I'd check with Doc, and he'd say, 
Well, Mick, they say they're going to come get him. But they never showed up. This Christmas, Joe Benjamin will be seven years old. So it's my hope that in about 11 years, I'll be standing up here sharing a story with you about how Joe Benjamin has given his life to Jesus. Maybe I'll be sharing with you what he's decided to do with his life as far as a career. Um, Hopefully, though, he will grow up and be trained so that when he goes back out into Mexican society, he can spread the aroma of Christ and it'll be a sweet fragrance for God to smell. I want to challenge each of you this morning to take a look at your lives and just you to yourself. Check and make sure that your life is a sweet aroma of Christ for God. The people you talk to, the things you do. As I said in the beginning, God has a plan. And he includes us in that plan. He invites us to be involved. He gives us conversations to have. He puts people in our paths. Unfortunately for me, sometimes it's Kansas drivers cutting in front of me there in Missouri, and it drives me crazy. But he puts people in our paths, and we have to react a certain way. So let's all make sure this morning that our life represents a sweet aroma of Christ. Another part of God's plan that uh, is pretty special is this table here before me, the communion table. We're going to go into that part of our service now. And this is a part where God invites us to be included in it as well. In fact, he commands us, do this in remembrance of me. As we take part in this service, as we take the bread that represents his broken body and the cup that represents his spilled blood, I would encourage you to take the time this morning to thank him for his sacrifice and thank him for including us in his plans and just um, make sure that he knows that your intention is to produce a sweet aroma this morning. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's such a, such a pleasure to be in your house here this morning. And Lord, as, as Christians all over the world take part in, in this communion time, whether we use a square piece of bread or part of a bun or a cracker, or whether it's juice or a bit of wine or even soda up in the village of Chalapa. Lord, I just, I just pray that you'll bless each and every one that's partaking this morning. And Lord, it's with that that we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. And we want you to know, Lord, how much we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.